well. Oh. So where are we going? Oh, here? look, just here to start with. My goodness me. What's that? So what is this? Do you remember this? I never did anything like no, this. I, I mean, it looks... Uh, it looks... Uh, pretty much just like an edit controller, an early version of DVE-800, yeah. We're just working yeah, out what's here? Just working out, looks sort of like a 600, obviously a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, two shuttle knobs, one for each machine. Um, assume it's 422 control, yes. What have we got? Edit. So you've got one for... There's the player. Yeah. Players died out there. So I suppose the important thing to say is that this was a cuts-only device and it could be from tape one to the other one. Yes. So the process was you'd control one machine and record it onto the other one. Correct. And you'd mark it in and out and then it would go across to the record deck. And uh, synchronisation to get the two to the edit point at the right time. You get the player and the recorder at the point you selected. Uh, um, which is what most all edit controllers yeah, did. Yeah, so you had a preview, so you could so you preview, could practice the edit, so practice the edit, and then you Got press it. the red button when you were happy. Oh, I don't know where we are here. But their uh, edit controllers are pretty similar, actually. They just have more features the later on you go into the uh, time frame. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a shuttle knob and which one's the top one is the recorder there. presumably there's a mark in and presumably the that's what I'm looking, looking for. for I'm just exactly oh, what I'm looking for at the moment go to in out no I'm not sure that's the mark in is it let's, let's go to in and the out is that a, oh, I we think haven't got mark it and go to yeah but we haven't marked one yet have we? No. I think they're here aren't they Player recorder in, so recorder. Is that simply a one touch? I don't know. Go to in. Uh, this doesn't seem to be working, does it? Time. <laughs> go to in. Go to. Go to. It's not doing it, is it? Why is it not doing it? Recorder, recorder, in, out, there's the marker. Entry, ah, look, okay, there we are, it's a big button there, look, it says entry. So, I guess you go recorder. So, so is that mark one? That one, made one? Let's see if it goes to in now. Oh. What's going on, Phil? Personally, I've never seen one of these in my life. <laughs> um, why doesn't that work? That's not toggling, is it? It's not toggling. That's not toggling. Because you've got to do two fingers. No, no. Well, I don't know. Rec recorder. See, it's not not got no. a little light on, is it? I don't know. I don't quite understand that. It must it must be solvable. Um, so what does that do? This is interesting. Uh, got the time code in the screen up there on the little LED display, which is very much like a 600 that I am used to. So that is the recorder you're that's playing the recorder with. Side there. So let's the try player, and mark an in and out on that. Well, that's what I'm doing. So we go. Let's let's go at the top of that. Go to the bottom and mark at the bottom of the pan up. So if we go recorder, why is that not changing? Why is that saying P1? It says P1, it uh, won't change to no, recorder. Player one or player yeah, two. But, it, but it's not that, that button. No. I would have thought recorder in. It's not doing it, is it? I don't know why. That's... No, this is a bit of a mystery. A, B, roll. In out, total no. Come on, what does that do? So if we if we make a, a player within an out, it should go. And it should do, yeah, it should do, but it can't. 
there's no in, is there? No. It's not making an in. It doesn't seem to be working, I'm afraid. Well, I, I'm, sh I'm sure it's I us. I think that would go... I, I reckon yeah. it's us. So player, can't get rid of player there. That's your player. There's your player. Oh, have we got any material on the player? Going backwards, are we? Oh, we're at the front of the tape. There's the... Oh, it's a bit temperamental. It's... I don't know whether there's anything on here. Oh, there we are, yeah, there's a picture. Sort of. It's in tape, it's not in... It's in EE, isn't it? It's not in tape EE, I'd have guess. On the... Uh, one of these buttons here should be... Uh, as I said, I've never driven these machines, really. Let's just come round and have a look. Is it in the tape EE switch? I can't see it. I think the player is not playing ball with us here. We're trying to uh, mark an in on the player and mark an in and out on the recorder and preview and edit. We won't do one just in case we mess the tape up, but at the moment we are struggling to try and work out which button does which on this controller because, as I said, I've never actually seen one of these in my life before. Um, I used an earlier version, but this one, they've added some features that I don't know about. What's well, my memory of these? I've never seen one of these in my life. So, but as we were saying, that the, the functionality is very similar to other things. And basically, this can control two players and one recorder, and you can choose which one is which. And at the moment, we can't find out how to mark an in and an out. This should be, that should be very happens. Yes, it is actually going back somewhere. So this mm -hmm. monitor seems to be looking That's at the, the recorder. recorder. That's the recorder, yeah. yeah. I can't find it. And this is the player, That's so the we're player trying to find play. something to transfer from there to so there. So if we just play, the, just play the player and see if it's going to play ball, it's not very happy at the moment. So if we mark an in somewhere... With it running. With it running, and then hit that one, does that move? Is that... I think it's the recorder's back. trying to look for something. The player doesn't seem to want to play ball still. It's still playing, isn't it? Player. Yeah. The player will work in... The player seems to work in freeze mode, but not in any other mode. That's a bit of a shame. Yeah, good job. Where's the... I don't quite know why it's doing that. Well, you would normally have a pre-stripe black and burst tape in your recorder starting at whatever time code you wanted. I mean, if it was just a gash tape, it would start at zero time code. If it was a to program you were making, normally our programs would start at 10 hours. So you go 9.59, 59 would be one second before the program started. Program started at 10, and you would start, put your first entry at um, 9.59, 58, which was two seconds before the start of the program, which gave the uh, network a couple of seconds to get into the show. Put, put down your first shot, mark an in, mark an out. If you had an out, perhaps you didn't have an out, you had a long sequence that you just marked an in on both machines, hit the red button or the preview if you wanted to rehearse it first. And then you would copy from the player to the recorder, whether it be sound, vision, both, whatever, until you'd had enough and you wanted to stop, then you'd stop and that edit would then be stored. Um, and you would then start find the next sequence that you wanted in your show and on a machine like this it was cut edit only you couldn't do dissolves because uh, there was to my knowledge no method of driving a mixer off these although you could do it by some sort of bodging and frigging which is what I used to do with a, a similar machine I think they had a GPI if you wanted to I think to. correct yeah. you're right there Phil yes they used to be which is what I used to do it could generate a GPI which could trigger a vision mixer to to do a mix or a wipe I um, mean, it was a bit Heath Robinson, but yeah. it, it did used to work. And so for the uninitiated, all of these bits of equipment having were Sony, and Sony had a language and an alphabet. So this is called a BVE... 800. 800. So that's Broadcast Video Editor. So B was Broadcast, V was Video, E was Editor, and then U was Umatic. And, and it became the industry standard. So... Blacking a tape, we keep mentioning it, but no one would know what that meant unless you'd done it. A tape won't record unless in an edit system 
unless it's already been what we would call striped with a black video and a time code. And time code gives every single frame an exact reference to edit to. And one frame is 25th 20 of, of a second. And, a and, um, and 30 of a, of a second in America, just to make it easy to understand. Um, but we're not quite sure why. There's definitely black because it's got time codes. Yes. I mean, the only, the only time you didn't actually need to have a, a blacked tape or a striped tape, whatever you want to call it, was if you were assemble editing. Now, assemble editing was exactly what it says. You were making an assembly, so that would then record its own control track and time code and vision without having to have a track, a black and burst track underneath it. But you would very seldom use that for making programs because it was very difficult to continue because of the difference of the machines and trying to get a particular tape to edit in another machine was very difficult. So you would always for a program put down a control track which was black level, time code and burst, so full color signal but just black, silence because you didn't want any spurious sounds cropping up during your edit. So the first part of your session before and during lineup would well, could well be making this control track tape for the duration of the show that you were making. And then when the producer came in, you could then start and do his side of it, which was the edit. Your side was the technical bit to get the tape into a situation where you could use it. We are having a little bit of trouble getting this edit controller to work. And I'm rather annoyed with myself that I can't work it out. Is there an assemble button, maybe? Yes, there is an assemble mode. button there. Is this out here? We're in insert, so that, that's OK. So no, you've probably got to switch that off to put that on. So the buttons allow us to choose whether we're transferring all of it, which is assemble, or video and audio, or just video and audio. And we can select that there. And at the moment, we've got video just only. Video. Um, and we're trying to find the mark in which doesn't seem to work that's all uh, this this these machines had two audio tracks later on uh, the number of tracks went up to four and even eight much later on with the digi beta um, via clever external boxes um, these umatic from my experience were used for offline editing because the machines themselves were relatively cheap the controllers were relatively cheap and, and an editor could sit in, an, in a little room, a not expensive room, with the producer and go through all his rushes, that is the stuff that comes off the camera, the studio, whatever, make the decisions up there rather than having to sit in a very expensive online suite um, and make those decisions there because every minute there you could be wasting £50. Much better to spend £2 in your offline suite uh, making those decisions than £50 in an online suite. And these sort of things we would use in a truck, maybe, after a football match to do a... In, in America they call it a video news release of a quick few clips of the goals or something like that. And then you would transmit that at the end of the programme for the news feeds to take. And they were allowed in America to take one minute for free. Don't know what it is over here. Uh, the only difference was at the time the machinery worked and it's not working yet. <laughs> we can talk about the rollback and mix. That was done because post-production had no mixing, video mixing or wiping in those days. When we did shows like The Good Life, I seem to remember doing it on back in the early 70s, because the studio had a vision mixer, obviously, and um, what we would do, there would be another machine, so you'd have three machines, uh, downstairs in VT, two of them would be recording because we always had a main and a backing and you'd have another machine which was the rollback and mix machine. Now what that would do, you'd come to the end of the scene, you'd stop, there'd be a costume change or whatever it was and if some sort of transition of time that they wanted to put an effect in and the rollback and mix machine would go back beyond the last cut in that scene run it in and at the desired point the director would cue the artist and then the vision mixer would mix across to the live action so then you had a tape recorded on your main recordings you had the outgoing scene and then you had the, the outgoing scene again with the new effect on it so what you had to do was join the outgoing scene to the new incoming scene and that's why we went back to a cut 
because it was virtually impossible in those days to make a join not on a camera cut because of the power sequence. So that was quite fraught. It was very limiting in as much as you had to make that decision there and then in the gallery. There was none of this, I'll rehearse it that way, rehearse it this yeah. way, try this, try that. None of that in the 70s. You did it and if it went, if the director at the time was happy, that had to be it and that was it forever. You couldn't go back and do it again. That was um, just another little trick that, that happened in, in the 70s. Well, I, I joined ITV in 1963 and the first Christmas we did a Tommy Steele show and this tape was so expensive that the board had a meeting to decide how many edits we could have in the Christmas show and they approved two because as I recall they were £200 a tape in those days or something of that order. It, absolutely, they were unbelievably expensive and that's why today a lot of the shows yeah. done in the yeah. 70s on these tapes are missing because we had a thing in the Beeb called tape servicing where you would take a tape like this, take it out, put it on a machine, record black level on it. Um, there's nothing in here but it's locked. Um, even getting the tape out even. took four men. <laughs> <laughs> this is not I think this is not working like it should do, but it doesn't matter. Anything. That's not important. That you record black yeah. level for 90 minutes and then as a direct entry engineer I would sit there and watch black level make sure for 90 right. minutes to make sure there were no serious damages on the tape. And if that if I decided that there weren't serious damage on the tape, that tape would go back into stock for use again because they were so expensive. So you have things like Nat King Cole's last ever BBC series gone. Loads of stuff we, we know is gone because of the value of the tape. Now that, th these days that doesn't happen mm -hmm. as media storage became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, the other problem with these tapes was their longevity. Um, they would form a thing called white powder which if you left them for any time in a bad environment you'd get a powdery substance forming like on the tape. Like a battery. And that would play havoc when you tried to play it, it didn't work. So they, the archiving project then started to moving them off, cleaning the tapes and getting them off onto another format onto... We went to D3 and then that became dead. It's a nightmare trying to work out a format that is going to last into the future. Difficult. Anyway, so 2 inch had its day and it stopped being regular use in about 80s, early 80s, 80, what do you reckon? I don't think so. I think, I think the paradigm shift was in the early 80s when Sony bought out a one inch machine which had four audio tracks, cost 30 grand. These machines we're talking about used to cost a quarter of a million quid, as I recall. And Sony brought out one inch tape deck and this is a one inch tape, show that one versus. So that's two inch, this is one inch. That's got a tape in it as well. Mm. And um, so suddenly we had a much more affordable device. In fact, it's bizarre, but I had in my facility in London, I had 10 one inch machines and LWT only had six. <laughs> I was quite proud of that at the time. But, um, uh, but and the, there was a portable recorder as well, which I'm not sure there was. Ampex did make a little recorder that was portable but only had four minutes recording time, which wasn't a lot of good. Now, interestingly, I can see this is a, B <laughs> a BBC VT recording report. Now, this is what we used to put in with every tape. When we made a new recording, we would fill out one of these green forms and you would put on it what was on the tape. You'd sign it with your name so that if there was a problem with the recording, you could trace the person who did it. Well, that was the theory. And uh, this one was a recorded date 82, 7th of November 82, RNL Magic Lantern Program 1 pre-edit. So this is an mm, insert tape of some sort, but this, this marked a big change from the quads because the quad was a transverse head going at 90 degrees to the tape direction. The one inch was a helical machine going like your VHSs or everything you know now tape-wise, where the, the the head drum basically revolved in a similar direction to the tape, so the tracks were laid down on a slant. The tracks were a frame at a go, effectively, so that meant if you stopped the tape, you had a whole television frame. So lo and behold, from two inch, where you could not see the picture, 
when you stop the tape. So that made editing something like boxing very difficult because you just had to guess. You could stop the tape now and look, ah, right, okay, that is the frame I want or that is the frame I don't want. I can see it, so that's where I'm going to mark my in. Very precise. Some programs used to go via an audio studio um, on a Sunday morning. I, uh, sorry, a Dutch detective series, I remember, um, with we used to be dubbed and the only way that we could get the timing up to the um, to the sound gallery was a stopwatch you they would talk to you on the phone and they ask you what the time code on the tape timer was and they would then do a stopwatch <laughs> and work out where to put the effect in I mean that is as basic as it was and I remember being asked one day by a producer could he could he come down and rig up a camera pointing at the tape timer so they could feed that up to the sound gallery so they could then work out themselves exactly where they were on tape. That was too logistically difficult, but you can see how basic things were in those, those days, early days. So this is a 900, isn't it? Yeah. 910, actually. 910. So moving on, this would have been early early 80s i think um sony very significant in the transition to enabling facility houses to open because until then as we said earlier uh tape decks quad were over two hundred thousand pounds suddenly they're thirty two thousand one inch and they've got more facilities and um and sony developed a, a much more sophisticated uh, QWERTY based, effectively these keys are all what they call them, soft keys, they've been programmed to do specific things so now we could control anything up to eight machines I recall and run them all at the same time in sync so that with a vision mixer in the middle, like this is a vision mixer, this is a very small one built by Grass Valley and in the day we always used to say you never lose your job for buying a Grass Valley because it worked and it worked very reliably. And, and sometimes you could program through the keyboard a dissolve of say 30 frames and it would do it automatically, run up all the decks and do the dissolve at precisely the right moment uh, and transfer to the master tape. Um, and, and if you, sometimes you wanted to do it manually because there's something different, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, there's something about a human doing things sometimes that's different to a machine. And so sometimes you want, uh, maybe you wanted half mix and things like a half mix were very difficult to program if you could at all. And then on top of that, and I think it's worth saying at the time that in my day in the early 80s, we would, the editor would do everything, including the editing and the audio and the, and the graphics. So we had a machine, which we haven't got here, called an Aston character generator, where we could make all the lower thirds. So my job in that day was to make all of that first thing of the day. Uh, you make the end roller and all the lower thirds, and then you'd put them on as you went. And what you, by then you, we can see here, we're building an edit list you see that and and then what you would do is go back to the moment where you wanted the graphic redo that edit and this time you'd add the lower third or whatever I always did it as a thing at the end of the day so you concentrated on one thing at a time so you did all your graphics in sort of not one go but a, a session at the end of the day this kit in the beeb came in um we were still on one inch as the, broad, the main broadcast format, so all, all programs were on one inch, but um, location stuff started coming in on Beta SP, and we had one of these suites, very similar to this, actually, with a BBE 900. It was just the predecessor of this one. There. Um, There's one down there, between the machines. Yes. So this is Beta SP, so we've gone We've gone from this to this in about 12 or 13 years, um, which is fairly typical for the industry, an exponential um, arrival of technology. So we're getting um, camera tapes coming from OBs or what have you. In my particular case, it was Ski Sunday. The uh, tapes would come back from the ski resort 
on a Friday or a Saturday morning and we'd have to make the little start of the show which involved a lot of vision mixes. Now, doing that on one inch was impossible out in the big area that we had at Television Centre and they didn't want to pay for a suite. So we had one of these. So we had one, one tape with all the bits on it. So we wanted to mix to the other one. So we had to copy off, make copies of every alternate shot to another beta tape two beta players, one beta recorder, just like we have here. Point out what a mach beta machine is. This is a, this is a, which is the recorder? Nothing, I'm not taping it, is it? So this is a beta cam SP. Um, helical scan, as, I, as, as was the Umatic actually, but of a much higher quality. It's a composite machine, composite video, analog machine, basically. Uh, first brought out by Sony in 80, around 80, mid 80s, uh, yeah, mid 80s. Um, the first time BBC post-production used one in real anger was at the Calgary Olympics in 88. But I say I was using them on the little suite with with an edit controller to make the little sequences with dissolves because the, as Phil has explained, the edit controller can talk to the mixer via a, a 422 link, which is basically a nine pin cable so the this controller which has a chassis uh, somewhere it, it this is not all of it there is a, a, a big chassis that goes with it and that will talk not only to the videotape machines it will also talk to the vision mixer so you can do everything from this little keyboard which makes it much more relaxed way to work you're not fighting with like in the two inch days you were fighting with the tapes and fighting with the controls and stepping back and walking here and there you do it all from here what it did do of course was it did away with your assistant now the way editors learnt to edit in my day was you were the playing man which was the person on the two inch machine playing in the tape to the editor over there and you would learn you would pick up what the editor was doing why, why was it you could ask him you'd work it out why did he do this? Why did he do that? You would learn to become an editor. As soon as these came in, you were on your own. You had three machines, all the tapes, the producer, possibly the commentator with you, a voiceover man, and you did it all yourself. So the learning process, sadly, disappeared. So it became more difficult to learn the basics of editing as soon as single um, controller operation came into being. That's actually a good point and something I should explain because we know and we're too close is all this kit would probably be in a technical area up the corridor with one engineer who perhaps loaded tapes uh, as opposed to us loading tapes. Yes. So yeah. um, and, um, and, and that was the moment really when facility houses came into being in the early 80s in London and, and even the BBC would code book facility houses, maybe because you had a special effect they didn't have or wanted, uh, and they would book, book it by the hour and pay by the hour. And, uh, and it, was, it was made possible by the, what was really a paradigm shift of supplier because um, suddenly people like myself could afford to build an edit suite which in the early 80s, probably cost 140,000 pounds. But, you know, before that, it would have been a couple of million. So suddenly, people like myself would offer services. So this would all be in another room. And this here, which we haven't pointed out yet, is the sound desk. Limited facilities, this one, but enough for what we used to do. Yes, agreed, yes, you didn't. You had, yeah. uh, on Beta SP, you only really had two, <coughs> two usable soundtracks. The, the, there were two more, but they were FM tracks, frequency modulated tracks associated with the vision. So you couldn't, you couldn't split them away from the vision. The two tracks themselves, of course, were a bit limiting. You could do, you could do stereo, but then you had no method of Bouncing. dumping stuff up and down from one um, to, to be able to do a sound mix across a join, which is what we as videotape editors always did, because personally I was working on football or cricket or something like that that was on the air in two hours time and I, uh, there was no, no way could it go off to a sound dubbing suite to get done. We had to do it all. So you couldn't, unacceptable to cut effects, cut football effects, no, absolutely not. You had to mix it together. So there had to be ways of doing that. So we either did it by using one track, working in mono, using one track as a bounce track or 
we had to have a quarter inch machine running alongside and use that as the bounce machine and that was a little bit tricky because that run up was um, different was all over the place and you had to resync it but that goes back to two inch days it wasn't until the four track machines came into use and more sophisticated bounce machines that we got really down to the nitty gritty of making high quality sports highlights which is what i specialized in very quickly to a very high standard um, still using one of these effectively a few more bells and whistles came along with a with a later version called the uh, 2000 because it could deal with um, with a thing called pre-read. I don't know whether we want to talk about that well, now or slow later. Slow motion, that was the main um, thing. Uh, and you could, yes indeed, the, the, with the advent of the, even with the one inch machines of course, one inch machines could do slow motion, albeit not very, you had to control it by hand, so much of the day replays, which quite interestingly always used to be done by a thing called a video disc, of which there were only two in the UK back in the 60s um, that was driven by a specialist engineer who was on in there for six months at a time and it could record for 36 seconds and that's it so as soon as the director called I want to see that you had 36 seconds backwards from where you stopped the recording that's all you had there was a, a switch in television center which switched between the output of the disc and the incoming outside broadcast and that switch went to network so the control was done by a guy downstairs. The producer there would select the point he wanted, run the slow motion, the engineer would go donk, you're on the air, finished, donk, back again to the live OB. And that was done on talkback from Manchester or wherever it was. So there are only two of those in the country. So when One Inch came along, that revolutionized that. Match of the day in those days with the video disc, you edited your match, you left the holes, you had to wait for the video disc to become available to drop in the slow motions. As soon as one inch came, you could do it all yourself on the front panel. With these, you could do it on here. You could drive the slow-mo from here. You could teach it to, to slow motion. You could motion. also learn. If, yeah. you, if you had half an hour, you could teach it to learn. Otherwise, normally you just do it, do it with your finger. You just became adept at driving the tape. If you want to freeze on a particular point and go on, you could do all that, drop it in. Everything became much more flexible, the productions got better, more sophisticated, but that's what technology did for you. Increasing technology, increasing program complexity and speed as well. Things could happen a lot faster. I think it's worth saying at the moment that we've mentioned how many, all these tapes were coming in, whether they were beta, BVU was another one, or one inch, doesn't matter, but they were, all from different sources, all from different places, and therefore the editor not only had to do the editing, but we had to have a means of lining all this equipment up. And so the first job of a camera crew of every day of every tape was to put what we call bars and tone on the tape. And that gave us an audio and a video reference that we could line up using the equipment like this scope and thing here so that we would set them all up to be the same on the day and that's as close as you could get. Uh, and, and it hasn't changed really, that's how it is. Yeah, so we had a lot of, uh, yeah. lot of different format of stuff come in. I yeah. mean, nowadays I guess a lot of DVDs come in. I mean, when I was working there, bits of clips of films were coming in on DVD, which is, to me as a tape person was a bit, was a yeah. bit strange. I thought, how can you get all that video on? Anyway. Um, but we used to get, yes, some stuff was only available on VHS, so we had to upgrade VHS to, to get it onto one inch or, or to beta SP to be stable enough to insert into a, into a transmission program and, and was the quality good enough? That was a big issue back in the 70s and 80s. Is this material set, suitable for transmission? Now, it doesn't seem to matter. You put it out, whatever the quality, but um, the news value... Community television. The, the news value can override <laughs> the technical quality sometimes. But yes, we dealt with... Um, with little um, camera DV tapes was another thing we used to use on Ski Sunday for the downhill run where Graham Bell would, would um, have his little camcorder in his hand and go screaming down the mountain with his little camera and he would talk, he'd hold it like that and he'd, he'd go, oh, here we come, come out the tunnel jump now. Oh, oh, this is good. And he'd go on down and he'd go, and that tape would come back to television center and I would stick it into the suite with one of these and make the downhill run for the Sunday transmission. Um, so that was a sort of a, so we needed a machine that could play DV, and if we um, 
normally we would copy that onto a beta SP or to one inch so that it could stay in the library and not get lost because the DB tapes are so tiny. But that's just another advancing technology needing to get that material into a format so you can get it out on the air. I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying, um, well, I thought you were a video editor. Why, why are you being a DJ in, in the sailing club doing sound? I said, well, because I worked on videotape, we did the sound. Now, if we go right back to two-inch days, and you remember Bob Wilson, the Arsenal goalkeeper, used to do his little, um, his little chats on a Saturday in, in football focus, uh, and he would want to talk about something. And this was on two-inch, it was very difficult, and he wanted to talk over the pictures. Now, on two-inch, with one soundtrack, that was difficult. We had to record his voice onto a quarter-inch machine downstairs while he watched the pictures, and then we had the effects, the, the, the crowd noise on the videotape, so we had the two in different places. Now we had to get that sound up onto the two inch tape as a mix. So we would copy the sound effects from the two inch to one track of the quarter inch once we chopped up the words with a razor blade so that it all worked, copy it down, and then we had to put it back. Now, being that a two inch was a quad, and it was as soon as you lifted the head. This was very dangerous, seriously dangerous stuff in there. What you would do is you'd go into audio record and then you would have to come out of audio record. Well, you couldn't just come out of audio record because you would leave a hole between the erase head and the play head. So you had to stick a card in under the erase head to stop the erase head working. Now that was called carding out. Now that was very difficult, potentially very dangerous. You could rip your finger off, you could wreck the tape. But that's what we did, that was what was done. That was working with sound on two inch tape. Became a little bit easier on one inch because we had more soundtracks to play with. You could play sound up and down, mix in this, mix in a bit of that, easier. Come to here with an edit controller, much easier. You could dingle your sound, put it where you wanted on any of the four tracks if you had a four track machine. Um, and you, you just got used to mixing the whole thing. We would make stories and then uh, your Alan Hansons would want to talk over that story. Well, no, we didn't have razor blades now, no, we were in the modern era, so we would dub. They'd go into a dubbing booth and we would mix the sound in with the original meeting, perhaps meeting music points, perhaps meeting sync sound, getting all that to work. And that's why videotape editors were quite actually proficient at dealing with sound because they'd done it from square one. It just became a natural thing, whereas film editors normally put a cut and the dubbing was done externally. So the first time I ever used something like this was Channel 4's first drama. And um, Terence Donovan, who at the time was the royal photographer, had been commissioned to make their first drama, which was to shoot on the razzle at the National Theatre with two cameras for a week, every night. And Peter Hall, the Nationals director, was going to direct this, but he never showed up one day of the week to direct anything. So we recorded on one inch tape in those days for this particular show. And then, so we could edit it, we built a rig like this in Terence Donovan's office. And he paid for it and gave it to me as my fee. That's how I got into editing. <laughs> and it's not even funny. And what we did was we copied the one inch tapes to Beta SP, which these desks are, with burnt in time code. And burnt in time code is an exact reference to the time code on the track, which enable you to make what we would call a longhand log uh, of, of what you've been doing at the time. Maybe get a photograph of that somewhere. Um, and that's how we used to do it simply, not in a facility.